the Mm -hmm. mass murder campaigns that the state has engaged in between the world wars, the cold wars, the proxy wars, that alone should uh, make us suspicious of, are these the people who are really keeping us safe and stopping us from Thomas Hobbes's uh, nasty, brutish and short life? Or are Mm -hmm. they causing far more than they claim to protect us from? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. Keith Knight, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. I appreciate your time. So good to have you here. Um, we met at the Libertarian Party Co- Party Mises Caucus event in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we spoke on a panel together, and as I was just telling you offline, I thought many of the answers you gave we're both entertaining and educational, so very excited to talk to you today and help share some of your insights with my audience. Uh, by way of quick introduction, you are the organizer of the Voluntarist Handbook, which we're going to be talking about a few uh, essays from that book today. That is a collection of, I think you said, 50 essays from various libertarian thinkers on various topics, and you are also the managing editor at the Libertarian Institute. Should we start with the essay, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, coercivist and voluntarist? Um, can you tell us, for, I guess, first of all, who wrote that? And then what is this particular essay about? This is an essay by Don Boudreau, a uh, PhD economist from George Mason University. And what he says is that so many of the divides that we see are completely fake and arbitrary. The corporate press is constantly pushing black versus white, rich versus poor, man versus woman, American versus Muslim, which now has completely switched and Muslims are com- uh, totally off the uh, chopping block. And now it's America versus Russia and mm-hmm. soon to be America versus China, unfortunately. So he says, these are so obviously fake. They mm-hmm. put a divide in front of you. You can see even organizations like Democracy Now! will say, it turns out studies show that whites get loans at a higher rate than blacks and then they just end the segment there and Mm -hmm. they completely leave out that asians actually get approved more than whites so why Mm -hmm. leave them out because it's a constant fake divide so don boudreau says well the reality is when people are looking at uh the political situation logic kind of uh is uh is set aside and what people look for are villains to hate and heroes to cheer Mm -hmm. so what are Uh, What is rather a true divide that we could 
uh, based society on if we are to say what is just and what is unjust behavior. So mm. he says a true divide would be people who achieve their ends in life uh, coercively uh, mm. or by initiating violence or threats thereof mm. versus voluntarists, people who achieve any of their ends in life, whether it's where you want to have dinner tonight or whether it's what you want uh, in the future uh, career wise. He says this is a true divide where we can see who is right, who is wrong just behavior that is civilized and barbaric behavior that should be dismissed. This gets to the root of the most evil things in the world that differentiates slavery from voluntary work, uh, kidnapping from spending time at someone's house, uh, rape from lovemaking, mm -hmm. theft from trade. This really gets to the root of morality. So he says this is a true divide. Democrat and Republican is another fake divide. I remember watching John Kerry and George Bush have a debate. This had to have been like 2003, 2004. And Kerry's big objection to invading Iraq, murdering civilians, initiating a war based on lies, George Bush explicitly said, uh, it's been confirmed that uh, Saddam Hussein has bought uh, yellow cake uranium from Niger. Turns out that was a fake story. Uh, Dick Cheney said it's been pretty well confirmed Mohammed Atta met with Iraqi intelligence in uh, Czechoslovakia. That was fake. So Kerry's objection to all this evil was, mm. I think we should have sent 40,000 more troops at one point and, and really, you mm. know, g gotten serious about the war, not just dilly dallied. Looking back and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the the tax rate uh, discussion, mm. they're like, should it be 38 or 36 or 36 mm. versus 39 when talking about the uh, corporate uh, high income tax rates? All of those divides are fake. Don Boudreau says a true divide in society is coercivist versus voluntarist. That centrally really is what the book is about. Mm. No, that's interesting. So it seems like there's kind of this sowing of a false false dichotomy or false dichotomies, actually. This us versus them um, dynamic that, that statists largely attempt to create. Is the purpose of that to create more demand for regulation and statism like you just get people divided classic divide and conquer strategy you get people divided across different ideological lines and then from that uh you create some some internal conflict from which more statism is demanded is that kind of the general point it certainly seems that way just mm -hmm. because the follow-up to every evil is and that's why the state needs more power to tax and regulate. Yes. Uh, you know, racism is a uh, terrible thing. Vladimir Putin is a terrible guy. And there is a dangerous virus that exists. Therefore, my group and organization should be able to take more income by force and regulate voluntary exchanges between consenting adults. Now, even if you buy into so many of their fake narratives, it doesn't necessarily follow that mm -hmm. you should therefore give them more money and power. There could be a numerous uh, alternative methods mm -hmm. to, uh, to to achieving such a thing. For example, both Donald Trump and Barack Obama got together and lied ideologically got together mm -hmm. and lied about the Pulse nightclub murder of June 12th, 2016. They both came out and said this was a horrible crime against gay and lesbian Americans, and this was a hate crime. He was targeting them because they were gay, and we cannot allow such a thing to exist. It turns out that his 911 call, after murdering 49 people, injuring 53, he held the uh, remaining people hostage. He called 911 and actually explained his motive. The reason we can actually take his word for it is because the goal of terrorism is to amplify a message as opposed to conceal your motives. Mm -hmm. And he explicitly says again and again, you have to tell America to stop bombing Iraq and Syria. They're killing too many women and children there. What am I to do uh, here when my people are getting killed over there? Tell the U.S. to stop the drone strikes. Stop collaborating with Russia. They're killing too many women and children. Now you see how it is. Now you feel how it is. Mm -hmm. He said that repeatedly throughout this you know, 20-minute discussion I think he was on with. Uh, they transferred him to an FBI negotiator. You can actually find this transcript. So even when they say there is a real problem, someone used massive violence against innocent people and homophobia exists, it doesn't mean that the state should get more power. And in this instance, just as so many others, it was actually a result of state power. This was blowback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a result of government intervention in the first place, same with the financial crisis, as I'm sure your audience understands, mm. they say, well, there's a terrible financial crisis. 
Also, it has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve monopolizing the currency mm-hmm. as well as interest rates, has nothing to do with Fannie and Freddie guaranteeing terrible loans or Sally Mae guaranteeing uh, terrible college loans as well. So governments so often cause the very problem that uh, they claim to usher in the solution. It also looks like there was a great deal of gain of research uh, funding that was sent to the Wuhan lab of virology before they told us COVID is the new justification for uh, state tyranny through mm. uh, the Eco Health Alliance and the National Institute of Health. So again and again, even if the problems are real, they are either caused by government or the state is not a uh, successful solution to uh, what should be done. Yeah, so many great points there. And it so every time we get on these topics, I'm often reminded of one of my favorite quotes from Nietzsche. I probably repeated this more than any other quote. Everything the state says is a lie and everything it has, it has stolen. Um, sounds a bit extreme, but man, it's, I think you're hard pressed to find a counterexample. Uh, I'm yes. also sorry, go ahead. Uh, but w- w- one more thing on that. The reason they lie so frequently, I came across this thesis from a 1928 book by Arthur Ponsonby titled Falsehood in Wartime. He says all the countries lied to their populations. Mm-hmm. At, this is after the First World War. He goes, so are they like all secretly friends and all planning to lie? He goes, hmm. that seems extremely unlikely. What is likely is in order to get people to say, I'm willing to have my son's limbs blown off and mm-hmm. get him killed, you have to scare them into the most crazy psychotic state that they're willing to do literally anything. Putin's going to take over Ukraine, then Poland, then Europe, then South America, and then he will take over America and start murdering civilians here just like he's doing in Donetsk and Luhansk. Well, the reality is either Zelensky is going to be on the throne, NATO mm-hmm. puppet, or Viktor Yanukovych is going to be on the throne somewhat of a Putin puppet. That's the real dichotomy. So they always lie because they have to justify this totally irrational power grab that they otherwise wouldn't be able to justify if they told you the reality of the situation. They have to tell you COVID is killing people, especially children who are the most Mm -hmm. vulnerable. You have to wear a mask. You can't stand five feet apart and 11 inches. It has to be six feet (laughs) and you can't go outside till Moderna tells us it's okay. All of the lies have to occur simply because the truth is not going to uh, arouse the passions of the feeble minded like they'd like to. Yeah, it really is fear mongering at its worst. Um, I'm also reminded here of Rothbard's point that the real dichotomy is between taxpayers and tax consumers, right? Those being stolen from and those benefiting from the theft. Uh, You could also, I've also used the delineation of makers versus takers, which is kind of a simplification, like people that are building businesses and creating real value and trading with other consensual adults and those that are extracting wealth from those that are making wealth. Um, So is it this line, I guess the common denominator between all these is just consent, right? Like is the exchange consensual or not? And so is, is it, too overhanded to say that this is all a psyop like states just naturally engage in these psychological operations of trying to divide people across different racial or ideological or religious lines rather than show the true line which is between uh, again makers versus takers or taxpayers versus tax consumers or coercivist versus voluntarist Um, is this just nature of the business of statism itself I think so. I think it's an emergent property as opposed to a conspiracy. So you can say an an example of an emergent property is only like one percent of people are Scientologists. Yet if you go to the Church of Scientology, the top people there are 100 percent Scientologists. How could Mm -hmm. what are the chances of that happening? The answer is only people who are dedicated Scientologists get to that point in the first place. So, of Mm -hmm. course, we're going to see a disparity. Only the people who are able to. Uh, arouse public opinion in such an irrational way are able to be demagogues to Mm. grab all of these voters and which allows them to political positions. We've just seen too many examples over too many centuries to think it's like, well, it's unique to this time and place. And if it wasn't for CNN, well, then we just got to get rid of CNN and then we could have a virtuous state. It really is the nature of the state. It's like, all right, I'm going to start coercing people in a way no other organization in society gets the right to. 
Yes. I, I got to scare the hell out of people. I got to really lie. Barack mm. Obama says with a straight face, women earn 70 cents on the dollar for what men make, as if businesses wouldn't just hire women to do the job that a man does. <laughs> it, it's so ridiculous. They have to say such crazy nonsense in order to justify uh, the things they're doing. So, yes, I think it is uh, the nature of the state. Yeah, that's uh, that gives me a lot of dismay because we've been dealing with this, as you said, like basically across all of history. And it gives me a feeling that maybe there's not a true resolution to it. And hopefully long form conversations like this and education can sort of wake people up to the reality of this psyop and then let them see through the the illusions. But um, most people, to your point, they're not really engaging in rational thought and in these forums. So uh definitely a hard thing to wrestle with um okay the next essay we we're going to talk about here and this term gets thrown around a lot in libertarian circles uh, to the point where we're made fun of i think that people often say libertarians think the free market is the solution for everything um a free market is kind of an abstract concept for someone that's not uh, engaged in economics. So the title of this essay, what is a free market? How does, first of all, who wrote it? And then who, how do they unpack this, this notion? Uh, we've got a lot of meaning, I think, packed into two small words that we, you know, libertarians see it, say we have a high re resolution understanding of the free market. But when you say that to someone, a layman, they don't know what you're talking about. How does the author unpack the term, the free market, and, and define it? This is an essay by a Ph.D. economist, uh, Murray Rothbard, who taught at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And what he's trying to get to is the importance of a definition of a word so you can really grasp its understanding, much mm. like looking at something through a microscope gives you a deep, in-depth understanding mm. of the elements of whatever you're looking at. So this is important because when people make criticisms of it, you have to ask, are these valid, unique criticisms of the free market, or is this something that applies everywhere and they're just pinning it on the free market? Perfect mm. examples would include in the free market, people engage in very greedy uh, uh, activities. Mm. And this is just terrible. You know, you might have someone who has a lot of power. They use this power against very vulnerable people, and that's bad. Can you think of anything more greedy than the state saying, give me 30 percent of your income or I'll put you in a cage and shoot you if you resist? How about the health department in Kansas City when Rex Archer, the head of the health department, ordered his employees to pour bleach on food that was uh, meant to be given to homeless people by a charity under the guise of they didn't have a permit in order to give this food out? That sounds far greedier than anything I have heard of in the free market. So when it comes to greed, that is something that not only doesn't uniquely apply to the free market, but it applies far more to government. When it comes to the idea of profit, I, mm. the School of Life is such a good organization, but they just wrote a book titled Big Ideas Throughout History, and they said capitalism, the free market, is about making a profit. However, profit is simply when your benefits exceed your costs. Mm -hmm. So their psychic profit, even, uh, you know, if you're just hanging out watching Netflix, you are attempting to engage in a profitable action. But even if we use the uh, term as they're probably wanting to use it, mm -hmm. when your monetary uh, benefits exceed your monetary costs, look at all the policemen, members of the military, teachers, politicians. They're not unpaid volunteers. Right. They actually make money. So if they spend 50 cents or two dollars to drive uh, in gasoline to get their car to work and then they earn a hundred two hundred dollars that day they have profited ninety nine dollars and fifty cents mm. they're engaged in profit seeking mm -hmm. and, and politicians have tons of money nancy pelosi has this big fridge that she's showing on the james Corden show and we're supposed to think these people aren't engaged in profit even if the state monopolized the healthcare industry doctors are profit seeking and there's nothing wrong with that at all. No. So again, greed and profit are not unique aspects to the free market. The third example is when it comes to dog eat dog competition. This is when people are always trying to get one over on each other and it's very oh, combative and I hate it and I prefer cooperation. In order to 
run a business in a free market in order to actually have trading partners, whether uh, they're employee versus employee, uh, seller ver or uh, consumer, um, you have to first cooperate with tons of people. So you can think of uh, in Arizona, we have Winco stores and Costco uh, supermarket mm -hmm. stores. They are in competition. Mm -hmm. However, in order for Winco to first compete with uh, to eventually compete with Costco, they have to cooperate with millions of people to build a building, to get the electricity generating. They have to have this complex web of voluntary contracts to hire employees, to hire managers, to bring the food in, to make the food available, to market, to put up the signs. And then they end up competing against a place like Costco mm. for your dollars voluntarily. Also, does the concept of dog eat dog competition ever apply to democracy when a bunch of politicians get up but DeSantis and Trump constantly lying about each other or slandering each other. Mm. That seems pretty dog eat dog to me, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, even people who are pretty close ideologically mm. through democratic socialism. She uh, she says, Bernie Sanders is a sexist. He said a woman can't win. He said, well, I wasn't being a sexist myself. I was saying America's so sexist. They wouldn't vote for a woman. And, and there was this big technicality. Politics is extremely competitive. It's not like, well, if you guys want to vote, no, no, whoever gets the most votes wins, assuming these votes are counted with the machines and everything. But mm -hmm. the winner gets the votes. The other person loses. Mm -hmm. That's extremely competitive. So profit, greed, competition, nothing unique about the free market. He says the free market is an interconnected web of voluntary exchanges within a society. And instead of saying, do we have one or do we not have one? We actually have it on a spectrum. So Hans Hoppe defines it uh, more clearly. I just have uh, his definition off the top of my head. A social system based on the explicit recognition of private property and mm. non-aggressive contractual exchanges between private property owners. Mm. There are degrees of this um, where there's extreme amounts of voluntarism, some regulation, complete regulation, you know, North Korea to, I think, uh, Hong Kong would probably be the ultimate uh, dichotomy. Not mm. that Hong Kong is perfect or in a state of anarcho-capitalism, but that is uh, wh where we uh, see things today. This is according to the Fraser Institute's uh, mm. list of uh, economic uh, fr freedom index. That's why defining your terms is so important. It helps you avoid mind control. Yes. And that's uh, what the free market is. That's what Rothbard gets into in this essay. Man, many great points there. Uh, it, I've commonly, again, back to the importance of defining terms correctly. Uh, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on this. I've considered the line between greed and individual self-interest to be private property, actually, right? Like you want people pursuing their individual self-interest as far as possible, so long as they're not violating the person or property of others, right? That once you start to violate, like you start to steal from other people, I think that crosses the line from individual self-interest into greed, actually. So I don't, when you hear these terms thrown around, like, oh, the greedy capitalist, it's almost an oxymoron in a way. Like if this, if they're truly being a capitalist and they're only engaging in free market, voluntary consensual exchanges, I don't know that you could even call that greedy per se, because they're just, they're enhancing their own individual self-interest by satisfying the individual self-interest of others, right? Not stealing from them, creating value for them. And this is a very natural human motivation, like profit seeking. I, th I think you're being intellectually dishonest if you try to demonize profit, because like, how do you run your household? Do you run your household profitably? Like, do you try to bring in more than you spend? I would argue if you don't, you probably aren't going to have a household for very long. And so, and isn't it too, like, I, obviously profit is a psychological phenomenon, but if we just looked at financial profit, which is the most commonly understood form of profit, isn't that just a signal you're efficiently satisfying human wants? It's like the market wants a thing, wants a problem solved. I'm able to combine inputs in a way that, it's less costly than the outputs of selling the satisfaction, the good or service, whatever it may be. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that so far as I can tell. But if you are profiting by stealing from other people, that seems to be where the moral line gets crossed. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the difference between greed and, and self-interest in that respect. That is the great thing about the free market is that it recognizes the human nature constant that all human beings are engaged in self-interested activities. So having a state doesn't stop that from happening because the state mm -hmm. is occupied by the same race of 
of animals, human beings, that allows us to harmonize our self-interest that always exists. So what politicians do is they lie and pretend they're angels and say, well, I don't engage in self-interest, you know, as they collect millions of dollars. We, we need to undemonize profit because it's that it gets thrown around so much as if it's something evil, but it's actually the thing that's guiding uh, consensual market actors in, in the market space. So I don't know what you can't have. You can't have peace and long-term trading cooperation without profits, as, so far as I can tell. Um, and it's it's very much uh, a problem, I think, that we've kind of reframed profits as something evil in the minds of many people. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. So the next essay we wanted to look at is titled Three Thought Experiments. Uh, if you could please tell us who wrote that and what what this essay is about. This is a political philosopher, Jason Brennan from Georgetown. He wrote this in a book titled Political Philosophy, an introduction published by the Cato Institute. It's the shortest essay in the Voluntarist Handbook, and it makes such a vitally important point. So he says, Let's use three thought experiments and try to find the implications within these. He says, imagine virtuous Vanny cares deeply about others and is willing to do whatever it takes to save lives. She believes that processed sugar is a scourge killing Americans. So one day she packs a pistol, invades a local 7-Eleven and declares this here gun says you can't sell big gulps. Very helpful. He then goes into the case of Principal Peter, who really cares about people. Again, another caring person. So um, one day he uh, finds someone, grabs a hold of their wallet and confiscates 30 percent of their bank uh, the, uh, of their bank balance, but gives it to charity, which stimulates the economy and helps people. He then uses the example of decent Danny, who really cares about everyone in general, but especially Americans. So he goes to a BMW shop and says, anyone who wants to buy one of these German cars can buy one of the cars. You just have to give me uh, three grand first, which, you know, uh, with some BMWs is a very small percentage of what mm -hmm. you're overall spending. And other Americans pay for you know schools and libraries. So y you actually should be buying Chevys and Fords instead. And if I catch you not do giving me the money, I will put you in a cage and shoot you if you resist. So Brennan says, now anyone, any sane person would regard this as some people initiating violence against others. And almost everyone I ask says, yeah, that person should be arrested for doing the things that they did. However, when it comes to politicians, soldiers, and police officers, they claim the right to do these things so long as they first get permission from this group of people called government. So immediately, in the realm of morality, we're creating two distinct sets of groups. The same action is justified when this group called the state does it, but not when this group called everyone else on the planet does it. He says, mm. what if anything justifies this explicit double standard that almost all people have within society. He says this is one of the central questions of philosophy. That's what three thought experiments goes into. Um, I went a little long on it, but it actually takes like one minute to uh, to read that uh, th that chapter. I think it's so vitally important because it gets people in the realm of, all right, let's start really basic. I can imagine, you know, someone going into a 7-Eleven and forcibly stopping people. Sugar is extremely unhealthy, especially in large amounts. And what do you need mm. to be buying a big, a big gulp for? Eventually, people will say, 
I disagree with it, but people still have the right to do things. You should do a lot of things and should not do a lot of things. But that's not the political question. The political question is, should people who engage in buying foreign cars, not donating to charity, choosing to buy big gulps, should they be met with uh, being caged and shot if they resist? That's Mm. the question, not should they or shouldn't they. Mm. Jason Brennan is so good on that issue. That's why I uh, put it in the book. Yeah, great stuff there. It reminds me of many economic books start with kind of the Robin Crusoe example, right? Like a guy alone on an island and it it builds up from there. Like if, well, if there's one additional person introduced to the market, how does that change things? And really kind of get to develop uh, your concept of economics from a very basic intuitive position. And it sounds like he's doing that with statism, right? It's like these, you know, well-to-do or, or, good intentioned individuals, if they were to wield a gun (laughs) against you to prevent you from buying foreign cars or sugary drinks, whatever the thing is, uh, it gives people more of an intuitive sense of the evil of it or the, the immorality of it at least. So that seems to be very important and useful because when we talk about these things in terms of taxation and the state, it's very abstract, right? It's hard for people to kind of get their head around it. There's a lot. There's a lot of room for counter arguments. You know, we con- con- constantly hear, "Who's going to build the roads?" Things like that. If they don't steal from you, who's going to, uh, whatever art? You know, run the court systems. Things like this. So, is is that a good way? Again, trying to educate the layman on this. Is this? as you see it kind of the author's intent to try and just make very real world examples so that people can get their head around these larger abstract concepts like statism, taxation, et cetera. Yes. Because if he were to the example of uh, one of the people, uh, the Vanny, what he's actually asking is, is the food and drug administration, a morally legitimate uh, institution within society Asking something like that that is so complex and people already have some sort of pre-programmed answer in their brain. So he says, before we get to that, let's just talk about this. And do you see that the FDA is not just a stamp of approval agency, as there constantly are with things like Yelp reviews, things like uh, kosher stamps of approval, things like grass fed or all brand names are essentially some sort of stamp of approval to Mm -hmm. so people can build reputations. He says, Talking about the FDA is a little too complex, but starting here and then saying here is the central thing that's wrong with this person Mm -hmm. forcibly stopping you from drinking, you know, a a big sugary big gulp because you probably Mm -hmm. shouldn't be drinking it. It's not healthy, but that's not the question. The question is, are they justified in threatening violence against a peaceful person who's attempting to engage in this activity? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, that is what makes the FDA a unique organization. What tariffs are, are literally, right now, you are out of the country, and you and I are engaged in an untariffed, a a cross-country conversation, Mm. unregulated in an anarchic manner, Mm. and there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's no different in principle than if you were sitting in the next room and we were engaged in a voluntary conversation. So what Bren's doing here is um, really focusing in on what makes the state unique and why uh, we should oppose it, because there's so many technicalities that people get caught up in, and that stops uh, people from seeing the situation clearly. Yeah, it really obfuscates the principle itself. So when you just distill it all the way down in plain English to a very simple human interaction, it you you can't not see the principle, right? It's like, of course, this doesn't make any sense in this individual interaction, so then you can scale that up to a collective interaction. Like, well, if it doesn't make sense between these two individuals, why would it make sense in this larger, more systemic implementation? Um, that's great. I, w- I would really challenge people. I think this is useful too when you're doing podcasts or otherwise uh, sharing libertarian ideals that we do need to, you need to take these abstract things and reify them down into very simple, understandable, accessible situations for people to grok what we're saying here. Um Great stuff there. The next essay is titled Individualism Versus War. Um, Obviously, individualism is something heavily espoused in the libertarian tradition, just individual right to life, liberty, and property. I would argue that war is largely the extreme opposite of that. 
where life, liberty, and property is being rampantly violated. So who is the author of this essay and, and what does he do to unpack that dichotomy between individualism and war? The author is Scott Horton, who is the director of the Libertarian Institute, my boss over there. And when he's talking about individualism, a lot of people might think individualism is when people do things by themselves. Collectivism is when people do things together. Hmm. That is not uh, an actual explanation of what uh, the individualism is. Individualism is people cooperating in the web of society based on individual consent. Collectivism is when some people have the right to coerce others under the guise of helping the nation, helping the race, hmm. helping the poor for the greater good. Etc. Yes. Yeah. The reason this is important is because if you are doing something alone, you're just reading a book in your house, uh, you probably didn't write the book. You probably didn't chop down the trees to make the pages. <laughs> the author probably stole words that other people came mm. up with and put them in the book. You're probably not generating your own light. You're probably mm. not generating your own elect uh, electricity or air conditioning. You probably bought the house from someone else who built it. Even at the point of doing something alone, we're constantly cooperating. That is a true understanding of what individualism is. So with that understanding, Scott Horton says, war is ultimately about collectivism. During crisis, individuality fades in favor of team effort. During violent conflict, particularly between governments, the world becomes, especially it seems for Americans, a giant bloody football game. Our team versus theirs. Us versus them. Good versus evil, go team, go. Mm. So his thesis is that the only reason the average person is able to justify something like Operation Meeting House, bombing of, I think, uh, 100,000 civilians in Tokyo, Japan. This would have been in March of 1945, as deadly as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so few know about it. But they will immediately come back with, well, they started it, they had Pearl Harbor. As if the people in this geographical area, mostly civilians, had any part in the decision for the Japanese regime of Emperor Hirohito to attack Pearl Harbor four years earlier. Right. But they have put them in the same blob. It is literally mm. like me mm. going up to an American and arresting them and saying, well, Joe Biden on August 29th of 2021 murdered 10 civilians in Kabul, Afghanistan. Mm. Seven of them were children. So... Mm. I'm arresting America for what America did. Well, America is a group and mm. not everyone in a demographic is responsible for the actions. It's the equivalent uh, or a general understanding is that each person is part of a number of different collectives. So I would be part of the uh, male collective, the collective who's in their 20s. I'd be uh, an American who's in Arizona. I would be part of the uh, podcasting collective. Mm -hmm. You can constantly generalize people yes. and then hold everyone responsible for what a microscopic number of people mm -hmm. do. So because people are able to first buy into collectivism, Scott Horton says the uh, most dangerous extent of this thing, uh, of this assumption, is that it leads to literal mass murder. Mm. And they still manage to call us the ideology of greed for advocating voluntary exchange as they defend uh, indiscriminate mass murder. So he says this is uh, the underlying issue with uh, so much of what we see. The reason I chose this one is because it is a timeless message. It's something I wish people would have read in the First World War, the Thirty Years' War, the Spanish-American War. It's uh, so vitally important because it really gets to the heart of uh, of what the issue is. Even today, you'll see people say just ridiculous nonsense. Well, Xi Jinping is a terrible person, so we might have to go to war with China. Even though one, a former Republican, Richard Nixon, shook hands with Chairman Mao and Henry Kissinger shook hands with Chairman Mao. But we can't talk to President Xi. He is just absolutely evil. The U.S. had a formal alliance with who many say is like a terrific president, Franklin Roosevelt had an alliance with Joseph Stalin, but they're like, oh, but we can't talk to Vladimir Putin. He did bad things in Ukraine. Stalin murdered far more people in Ukraine in the Holodomor. And then after that, they formed the Allied Alliance. So all of these ridiculous things, all of uh, how smart people can make such ridiculous justifications that are blatantly irrational is because they first believe in something called collectivism. That's why I think Scott Horton's essay is important. 
Yes, man, really, really important stuff there. And just on your initial point there on the, the importance of the division of labor, like when you're reading a book alone, you didn't chop down the tree, you didn't invent the English language, you know, the author is using words that he did not invent. Uh, I was just reminded of that, the very important essay, I Pencil, that I think does a great job explaining the nature of the division of labor and how indispensable it is to the human enterprise, really building civilization itself. And then I, I liked your point too on that these excuses are being made to justify, you know, warfare, coercion, et cetera, at the collective level, right? There's a handful of decision makers inside of Japan that decided to bomb Pearl Harbor. And yet we think at, at this arbitrarily circumscribed collective level, like, oh, Japan did it. As if there was some entity out there, some animal named Japan that just attacked this other animal called the United States. But it, it, Again, it's a very low resolution depiction of the reality that, that there is a group of individuals that attacked another group of individuals. And it, you can't justify, well, let's go bomb these 100,000 civilians to make up or to, to establish retribution for an attack that was done. Um, so again, it's like the excuses are made at that collective level. Because if you described it, it's like, oh, this group of individuals attacked this group of individuals, it would not be possible to justify Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, for instance. And so is that that does that seem to be the danger then that these collectives are arbitrarily circumscribable, right? Like I I I can assign people to whatever collective I want. That's especially true in 2023, where people are changing their affirming their identity in a lot of different ways. Um, is that the problem here? Is that what's creating the irrationality? Is that people are not considering the world as this composite of individual interactions and rather are thinking in terms of these aggregates, you know, Japan, United States, China, et cetera. Is that what's what's giving way to the the irrationality? Probably just because you can see how quick these uh, th these groups change. So mm -hmm. the enemy can be whites or the poor. Now, realize that when progressives have had both of these as their recent enemies, a lot of whites are the very 99% that they have been claiming to champion for decades. And mm -hmm. then they flip on them just like that. A lot of the male privileged people, well, if you're in it for protecting the vulnerable, most homeless people are men because men tend to be bigger risk takers and uh, have higher levels of testosterone, but whatever. There's a ton of uh, reasonable explanations for the uh, disparity. But you'll notice that they're completely dumbfounded in how they can go from, I'm defending this group, the poor and the vulnerable, and we also need to be really happy that a lot of Russians are dying because that'll make mm -hmm. them weak and they won't be able to pair up with China if we have to go to war over Taiwan. Well, who do you think's dying? Do you think Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. is getting killed? in right. this war uh, do you think she, yeah. president she is like terrified for his life more or less no it's the very vulnerable people who right. you were using as the collective on you know uh, which you're uh, standing atop in this uh, parade to uh, bring them to uh the socialist heaven that mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to usher in so uh, yes uh once in order to justify so many atrocities you first have to collectivize people and then say how they are explicitly bad and how they are a unique evil so that's just a uh, another one of the uh, intellectual shortcomings that government schools have uh, given us yeah that that's a great example actually that there are many americans right now celebrating the death of russian soldiers in this conflict and these are young men being conscripted, presumably, into warfare by Putin and his regime. You're celebrating the murder of effectively, I think Rothbard says conscription is slavery, right? These are effectively slaves, in a way, of the Putin regime that are being murdered. And we're celebrating that as if that's harming Putin in some way. And I mean, I guess you could make maybe make an argument you're killing the slaves of a master. That's not good for the master, but that's not... <laughs> you're not harming Putin directly, right? You're sort of, by ideologically supporting or celebrating the death of young Russians, you're not solving the root problem at all. You're not even looking at the root problem. You're again, thinking in this low resolution mode of like, oh, what is Russia doing? Rather than what is the Put what is Putin and his regime doing? So, um, yes. Yeah, and, and, and you're totally right about that. Both sides, um, that 
in uh, Russia, the military service is mandatory, so it is effectively conscription. In Ukraine, uh, since February 24th of 2022, Vladimir Zelensky instituted martial law and uh, keeps all men ages 18 to 65 uh, engaged in forced military service. He's also outlawed 11 competing political parties. He has recently said that they won't be having elections this year on his fifth and uh, final year of his term, just because, uh, according to their constitution, under martial law, they don't have to. Confiscated property of the Orthodox Church, claiming that they're Russian propagandists, and he has nationalized the press. This is NATO's fighter for democracy. Yeah, I would just really challenge people to think more deeply about these issues. Like, it's not not very useful to celebrate or support the death of young men in warfare, even if you think it's hurting the, you know, quote unquote enemy, let's say, because it's not the decision maker that's being directly harmed. It's other uh, victims of the decision maker, typically, right, in warfare. And this is another reason why collectivism is so ridiculous. You can look at Zelensky or even America's uh, engagement uh, with military conscription and say it's all men ages 18 to 65. That's sexist and sexism is bad. We have to rail mm. against it. The problem is not sexism, even though it explicitly says only men, because if the problem was sexism, then you just have to enslave women as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, any military aged male that means 16 or older. When they're mm. killed, that's not counted as a civilian death. Yes, it's sexist. But if the solution was to be found in collectivism and making things, quote, equal, then you have to start murdering women indiscriminately, too. And then finally, it's fair. Well, that's still unfair. So even yeah. when you give the collectivists or the social justice advocates the complete benefit of the doubt and you say, here's an explicit example of sexism, their approach of more collectivism still wouldn't apply, even in the most blatant example. And yes, forced military labor is obviously slavery. Forced yeah. labor under the worst conditions. I would ask people, calmly think about, would you rather be forced to pick cotton or fight in a war for Kaiser Wilhelm, Tsar Nicholas, or Woodrow Wilson, where you get PTSD, get your limbs blown off, and are far more likely to die than if you were forced to pick cotton? First yeah. World War complete ridiculous nonsense had like 10 million deaths uh, i've yeah. read between uh, 7 and 10 million deaths yeah. in a war between monarchs uh and uh you know woodrow wilson <laughs> yes military conscription is one of the worst forms of slavery imaginable because you're more likely to lose your life or limb a lot of people don't like hearing that and i always yeah. get the emails afterwards well yeah. that's a terrible uh example look if just being kind and explaining rationally would get the attention of the Nina Turners of the world, unfortunately, uh, in right. order to get their attention, we have to say conscription is slavery and yeah. far worse than forced cotton picking. I'm sorry. And that is still completely evil. All the slaves in America had a right to kill their slave master and steal their property as compensation. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to degrees of forced labor and how bad things are. Yes. Yes. That is the reality of the situation. Yeah. There's no worse labor than war fighting. Right. Because it's the highest risk activity you can engage in. So if you're forced to do it, that's uh I would say the worst form of slavery you could really imagine. Okay. Um, I'm thinking too, just out loud here, how ridiculous and irrational this is. I think if we had the draft implemented in the United States again, in the wake of all this wokeism, gender affirmation nonsense, would we just see a whole wave of people <laughs> say we're, we're drafting men ages 18 to 30 Would all these men that were then drafted, just start switching their gender to get out of it. Like <laughs> Just, Trust just me, highlights. I've been curious. I've been <laughs> curious about that. If you go to sss.gov, uh, Selective Service System, they explicitly say in their frequently asked questions, what if I identify as a gender? The SSS goes by gender assigned at birth. Mm. Trust me, they've already thought their way out of this because yeah. they knew so, that it, it, it yeah, would be coming. Okay. So the yeah. wokeism and the gender affirmation is real until shit gets real and it's time to go to war. And then we see that it's all just a facade. Totally exactly. makes sense. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. 
For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a coin join. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Um, okay, the next essay we wanted to talk about is titled Private Governance. Uh, I would think that a lot of people would not think this was even possible, right? What government tends to go hand in hand with, you know, the public basically, right? Whatever the government's doing is often described as, uh, you know, public property, public interests, the greater good, et cetera, et cetera. What is private governance? Uh, who's the author of this essay and what points is he trying to make? Edward Stringham is a uh, PhD economist. Uh, he was working at Oxford at uh, the time when I came across uh, this article. He published it at the Cato Institute. So he makes the claim that, look, whenever the status say that we need to uh, look out for the free market, one of the things they say is that in the free market, there could be monopolies. This is uh, where one group has almost unlimited power. Under this situation, you'd get higher prices and worse quality than you'd otherwise get under competition. So he says they're completely right about that. Um, and that criticism also applies to the state, even when it comes to protecting people's person and property. Mm -hmm. Turns out this is just Edward Stringham's thesis is protecting your person and property is just another good or service that is met far better through voluntarily funded competition than it is through a coercively funded monopoly. So just on mm -hmm. the face of it, mm -hmm. the mass murder campaigns that the state has engaged in between the world wars, the cold wars, the proxy wars, that alone should uh, make us suspicious of are these the people who are really keeping us safe and stopping us from Thomas Hobbes's sh uh, nasty, brutish and short life? Or are mm -hmm. they causing far more than they claim to protect us from? Mm -hmm. Second, they cage a lot of people for victimless crimes. That is a great violation of life, limb and property have completely unjustified uh, fines for uh, other uh, victimless crimes. And every year they more or less brag it, they call it a service, the Internal Revenue Service, mm. taking a significant amount of your money, claiming to cage you if you don't chip in. This mm. is yet another violation of person and property. So is the state a unique protector? Not only is it not a unique protector, Stringham says, but it is, in fact, a unique aggressor. Compare mm. all the private theft versus all of the theft that the police engage in when it comes to civil asset forfeiture. Washington Post, kindly, I appreciate the post on this one. They said that civil asset forfeiture has actually uh, exceeded uh, private burglaries. So just on mm. that alone, forget about the, state, the fact that the state taxes coercively collects trillions of dollars through tariffs and, uh, and everything else, uh, and then has a monopoly printing press for uh, whatever uh, money they can confiscate. Mm -hmm. He goes, these are blatant examples of the violation of the thing the state claims to protect. He goes, OK, so we got the principle down. Monopoly bad, competition good, voluntarism good, coer uh, coercion bad. So the first thing that people say is, well, how would this work hypothetically? And he goes, well, hypothetically, um, you could have organizations that compete against each other and provide security in exchange for money and the reason they wouldn't necessarily go to war is when you have to bear the cost of violent conflict, mm. you're much less likely to engage in it. Mm. Uh, so you're much more likely to come to some sort of agreement. And mm. we do see this with competitors. Can competitors cooperate? 
it sounds like a contradiction to uh, the those ignorant of economics. However, if you have a phone from T-Mobile and I have one from Verizon, we're actually able to cooperate. Mm -hmm. When MV7 Sure makes this Dell com uh, doesn't make the same Dell computer, turns out Dell and MV7 Sure cooperate mm -hmm. with uh, CenturyLink uh, internet uh, pr providers and this uh, brother printer. All of these competitors are actually engaged in cooperation because mm -hmm. it actually uh, helps things out. Someone with a Gmail can send uh, an email to someone with Proton Mail because competitors even have an incentive to cooperate with each other. Same with uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Discount tire tires go on to both Ford and Hondas and you know everything else. Mm -hmm. So hy theoretically, they can cooperate. But Stringham says, actually, the case is far better than that. I can't remember the exact example he uses, but he goes back to the Middle Ages and says, here are tons of examples of private governance uh, arising. So what I will do instead is try to extract the lesson and actually give a real world example. I worked with a small business who had experienced ransomware. This is where you log into uh, your business network only to find that your computer is completely black and all of your files are encrypted. And up on your screen is a message that says, all of your files are encrypted. You can't read a goddamn thing. Mm. Pay us $200,000 and then you can read your files again. We will de-encrypt them. Mm. Now you can send the money and it's... Now this was, this was not some trivial example. This was, hey, everything we've worked for for the last 10, 15 years, it all uh, went away this morning. Because someone violated our uh, private property and uh, none of them, they're not a bunch of libertarians either. This is a completely uh, different organization. None of them said, quick, call 911, quick, call the FBI, call the National Security Agency because our property rights have been violated. And this is what the state does. First thing they did was they called a private security company in Arizona. This is an IT firm. What that IT firm did was use... Sentinel One, this is a cyber security organization to stop the hacking and protect everything else that was that had survived. They then used uh, PayPal's security team in order to keep their finances uh, adjusted. They contacted their uh, private banks to let the banks know, hey, stop authorizing payments to anyone unless I explicitly give them my stamp of approval. And then they use Google drive backup security in mm -hmm. order to uh, keep their previous files uh, th in order to get access to the files that were encrypted because those were saved because Google, a private organization for the most part, um, has the incentive to uh, have happy consumers so they can make more money for themselves. Mm -hmm. So when push came to shove, when it really, really mattered, something so vital, their entire business, they only went to private security. Mm -hmm. One person mentioned going to the state, uh, he wants the computer to be, you know, investigated. Uh, it, but, but literally, the complete opposite of what we're always mm. told. Well, if you're ever in danger, call the government. Right. It's like no one really thought that the state <laughs> would be the most effective approach. They yeah. don't have the knowledge or the incentives to create products or services that are really desirable. So it turns out protecting your person and property is a good or service just like anything else and should be uh, achieved through voluntarily funded competition as opposed to a uh, coercively funded monopoly. Tons of those real world uh, examples all around us. Uh, I went to the Slipknot concert. Very dangerous place. A lot of people on bath salts and tons of stuff <laughs> there. <laughs> and there was private security. I went to the Scottsdale mm. Mall a week ago. Tons of private security. Mm. And there's a lot of high-end stores that could get robbed there. Private security uh, made me feel safe. Every time I go to a Diamondbacks game, private security all around. Disneyland has private security. All these places all around us have the very private governance governments claim that mm. only they can provide. That's the great lesson from uh, Edward Stringham's uh, essay. Yeah, it just, again, from the libertarian standpoint, it's like any product or service that's provided by a private market actor tends to be lower, lower cost and higher quality than anything provided by a government agency. And it just seems to be a matter of incentives, right? The state is incentivized just to keep you docile and and uh, vulnerable to taxation. They're not not really too concerned with protecting your actual life, liberty, or property. 
um, that's a service that's much better rendered by a, a private contractor of some kind. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and of course, private markets have the incentive to not just cater to the 1%. People will say, well, if it, things are privatized and only the rich can afford them. Mm-hmm. I just got to steal the Michael Malice line of, yeah, if there was only private security, only the rich would have security. And if clothes are privatized, the only clothes will be tuxedos. If cars are privatized, mm-hmm. there will only be limousines. And if food is privatized, there will only be foie gras mm-hmm. and caviar available. Mm-hmm. He goes, no, there's actually an incentive for them right. to not just build yachts, but to meet the mass of consumer demand. So, uh, th- and no, the company, uh, uh, I'm not going to say their name. It was not Walmart, Amazon, Apple, or Google. This was a small company uh, yeah. close to, uh, to to where I live, but they use only private security because it was just more efficient and they have every incentive to cater to mm. the most people for their own profit interests. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. So that yeah. was just uh, an important uh, thing I should have mentioned originally. Yeah, no, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. The last essay we were going to look at titled six questions for statist. Um, Again, I, I people often get embroiled in this, oh, communism versus fascism versus socialism in all these different forms of statism. But it seems like the problem, right? The, the actual problem is all under the canopy of statism itself. So what are these six questions? Who is the author and what point is he driving at in this essay? The author is a uh, Canadian philosopher, Stefan Molyneux, who sort of became popular on uh, YouTube some years ago. And what he's saying is, look, there's a lot of technicalities when it comes to debating, you know, uh, the things about the state. First, they tell you to fight about health care, then fight about agricultural subsidies, then fight about tariffs, then fight about the band rights fighting in Ukraine. He goes, he, let's really get to the root of what the disagreement is between people like himself, anarchists, and people who advocate the existence of a government. He goes, here are the most productive questions you can ask. Because if you've ever been in a conversation with a government believer, you know that the conversations can last forever and mm. get nowhere. So here is his guide. It says, question one, does government actually solve the problem in question? So when people say, well, what if there's a dispute? Now I can go to a court in the absence of a government. I couldn't go to a court. Well, first of all, there's tons of private arbitration organizations all around us. There's authorities within society. Every you know company that you work with has some sort of like HR department. Mm-hmm. So that, first of all, there are, are alternatives. Second, government courts take years to render a verdict. There's an extraordinarily high opportunity cost in time and monetary cost with uh, finding a lawyer, hiring a lawyer, not finding a corrupt one. Because lo- <laughs> the lawyers that I've come across, some are either like the greatest people ever mm. or the absolute scum of the earth. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. extremely risky because you have to go to law school to get a license. Even if you know someone who's brilliant on the law, mm. they can't ar- argue on your behalf unless the state has granted them mm. a uh, pr- protective license. So claiming that. Well, courts exist. That doesn't mean we have universal protection. Leftists will constantly say what we should have is universal health care, as if the divide is between either everyone gets it or only some people get it. Mm. Giving the state a monopoly on health care. The state has a monopoly on education. Is everyone educated? The state has a monopoly on uh, uh, on policing. Does that mean everyone's private property is always protected and no one ever gets murdered? Of mm. course not. So governments don't always actually solve the problem that people are claiming. Best example in America might be something like Medicaid, where uh, the divide is, okay, there's people who can afford health care and people who can't afford it. For those who can't afford it, that's who we're worried about. Therefore, we're going to give them something called Medicaid. And we've seen a drastic increase in health care costs since the implementation of Medicare and Medicaid under Lyndon Johnson, of course, and they never apologize. So governments don't actually solve the problems. That's the first one. Second, can the criticism of the anarchic solution be equally applied to the status solution? So when people say, well, um, under a free market, you could have people only shopping at one place and this might lead to a monopoly. However, the very existence of a state is literally a monopoly on violence. If you try to compete with them by doing whatever they do, issue taxes, issue tariffs, try to regulate other people, you will go to jail because the state is literally a monopoly. So if your claim is 
I'm terrified of the potential of monopoly. Therefore, I'm going to advocate a monopoly. You are uh, certainly not thinking clearly. And that was Molyneux's point there. He said, third, is anarchy accepted as a core value in non-political spheres? So the examples he uses is dating, career choices, education, and so on. That people will often make these decisions based on profit incentive, how much money, how much they enjoy it, and whether other people can market or persuade them to do such a thing. But they usually rule out initiating force to achieve uh, such an end. So Molyneux's point is people love, love the anarchy they live, but tend to love the non-anarchy that they just so happen to have gone to school for 12 years to be told is terrible. Not a coincidence. Fourth of the six. Molyneux says, would the person advocating statism perform state functions himself? He's saying that uh, if someone says, oh, yeah, well, it's OK to issue property taxes to fund public schools. That's a very abstract statement. And people are used to saying it. They probably don't even think about it. So his question is to say, OK, before we talk about them, this concept, the state, I want to talk about you. Do you have the right? Let's let's look at this house over there. You watch the woman come out and you say, do you have the right to cage that woman if she doesn't give you 3% of whatever that state says her house is allegedly worth? Do you have the right to cage her and shoot her if mm. she resists? Just don't chip in to this education program. Does the Catholic Church have the right to do this? Because there, there are Catholic schools where people learn a lot. There's the Libertarian Institute, which provides a free education on history, economics, and philosophy. Does everyone have the right to do this? And if it's so justified, why are people so hesitant to do it themselves? When it comes mm -hmm. to rape, kidnapping, slavery, murder, people have no problem saying, hell yeah, I would have the right to defend myself or use defensive force against someone doing something terrible like that. But when it comes to, well, how about issuing taxes? And then they go, well, you know, we live in a society and society has rules and then they get extremely abstract mm -hmm. because it's so uncomfortable that they have to form, uh, form up uh, some rationalization. So because well, we should be very optimistic because if people truly believed it, they'd say, yes, I'd have the right to do it myself. The fact that they get extremely uncomfortable when talking about the implications of what they're advocating is what Molyneux uh, talking about. He says, number five, can something be voluntary and coercive at the same time? So many advocates of democracy especially will say monarchy is terrible. You just have someone rolling over you. However, democracy is done through the consent of the governed. This is a clear example of something that people only believe because the process of repetition has made them assume that it has to be uh, something that's legitimate. So since it's based on the consent of the governed, it, it uh, seems like it's not like you're actually not able to opt out of uh, funding the IRS or opt out of uh, engaging in these regulations and occupational licenses. So if democracy is legitimate because it's based on consent and people can't give their consent to disassociate with the Lindsey Grahams of the world, how can you say that the very thing that justifies your system, consent of the governed, it then necessarily violates by definition? That is Malu's fifth point. And finally, does political organization change human nature? So if you say, you know, but so Sean Hannity was having a conversation with Penn Jillette and Penn Jillette made some pretty good libertarian points. And <laughs> Hannity just says with all the confidence in the world, you know, those sound like, you know, sort of utopian ideas. I just have more of a dark view of how humans are. I think people are bad and can't be trusted as if that justifies anything that came out of his mouth previously. If people are so bad, what species do you want running the government? Hmm. Who's going to run the FDA? Is it going to be a bunch of owls and zebras? It's going to be people. But hold on. One second ago, people were terrible and greedy and couldn't be trusted. And now you give them uh, the power to coercively rule. It's one thing to say people are greedy and that's why we need a free market where we can disassociate with bad actors because people are greedy. What the Sean Hannity's of the world say is people are greedy and some of them should have the right to coercively rule over others. And all these evil, greedy, lazy people should be able to vote once every four years to determine who rules over everyone else. So whether you think people are all good, all bad, some evil. Well, that's actually an interesting one where you think, well, people are mostly good, but there are some evil people out there. Mm. What kind of personality do you think is attracted to 
hey, you get to coerce people to do things and they don't have a right to disobey you. You hmm. think it's the average person? No, of course not. It's the Lindsey Grahams and Anthony Weiners and Kamala Harris's of the world, the most psychopathic of them all. The average good person wants nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. So because the existence of a state does not change the very human nature, which that everyone since every political philosopher since Thomas Hobbes has used that as a justification for if there is a state, it's because life would be nasty, brutish and short and people are really bad. Well, then we can't have a state because the most evil people will be attracted to it mm. and in the free market, there are evil people, but they still can't get a penny out of your pocket unless you voluntarily give it to them. I hear Steve Jobs was like a total jerk, but thank God he didn't have some – his security was a private security team mm -hmm. uh, for Apple protecting you know, your material through things like passwords. So even, he, even the evil people in the free market have an incentive to be good people to cooperate with. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, the understanding of human nature and the implications – are important to understanding uh, economics. That's what I love about Molyneux's essay here. Man, it's so many good questions. Um, yeah, I think you've done just a great job of uh, articulating these points. Uh, this sounds like an excellent read for anyone that's curious about libertarianism. Keith, thank you for doing this. Uh, last questions for you. Where can people get the Voluntarist Handbook, and then where can people find you and your work on the internet? People can find it on Amazon.com. You can find it on Barnes & Noble. If you want a general idea of what the book is before you buy it, you can get a free PDF at libertarianinstitute.org. The mission that we have at the Institute is to create a free educational archive. So whereas progressives will say, we believe in free education, and by that we mean uh, you have to give us 30% of your income or we'll cage you, and textbooks are $300 each, and you just talk about the Pythagorean theorem all day. Mm -hmm. We actually believe in creating a platform for people to access free education in the form of video, podcast, blog posts, articles, essays, primary documents on events like the Oklahoma City bombing. We have uh, the, the, the uh, complete collection of uh, situations like that. Um, so, yes, you can get a free PDF on libertarianinstitute.org. If you want to get a physical copy, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, and uh, check out the uh, Libertarian Institute. We got a uh, number of uh, books coming out, a number of uh, projects we're working on. We want you to be able to go to the site and type in anything freedom-related, whether it's Winston Churchill, the Food and Drug Administration, agricultural subsidies, minimum wage, and get the freedom position on those things in the form of an article or an essay or a blog post or a video. So we're trying to bring a lot of diversity and trying to have really efficient posts so people in a short amount of time uh, can uh, see things clearly, as opposed to government schools, which get, after 12 years of schooling, they almost say, look, we know that you guys are so uneducated, you have to go to college at this mm -hmm. point. They mm -hmm. don't say, don't go to college. We just educated you for 12 years. What do you need college mm -hmm. for? They say, we screwed up so bad, you <laughs> got to take out tens of thousands of dollars of loans and spend four more years. It's the equivalent of taking your car to the car shop and them saying, after 12 weeks, you're going to have to find a car repair shop to take this to. It's like, what? What the hell are you guys doing with the car for this long? What are you doing from ages five to 18 with all these kids that make them so dumb in order to get a job at all? They need four more years of what you claim to have been providing them. Mm. That's why people should check out the Libertarian Institute, the book, the Voluntarist Handbook. These are more or less the 50 essays that took me from being a progressive to being a libertarian. And it's really efficient because it has people from the right, like Joe Sobran, who was senior editor at National Review for 18 years, worked right under William F. Buckley, and left-wingers such as Sheldon Richman, my colleague at the Institute, mm -hmm. uh, with a great article titled One Moral Standard for Them All and Social Cooperation. So it has a great variety, uh, very fast reads, and uh, even has original essays from a former police officer and uh, former Marines like Shane Hazel, who was in the uh, Georgia uh, governor election uh, like two years ago. So I think people will like the book and you can get a free PDF from libertarianinstitute.org. Awesome. We're going to link to all that in the show notes. And Keith, thank you for just articulating these ideas so well. I think it's very important for people everywhere. Um, thank you for doing this, man. Really enjoyed it. Anytime, Robert. Thanks for having me.